Hello, welcome to Learning to Drum. I'm your host, Adam Tevlin. We are in week 24, episode 21. Last week we completed the solo number three, and now we're on to a new concept. So this is a little different than what we would normally do. And we're at page 26, which is the multiple bounce roll. And this could also be called the concert roll, or the buzz roll, or the press roll. There are different names for this one type of roll. And in concert band or in orchestra, most of the time people play their roles like this as opposed to in marching band or drum corps where the roles are more open. In drum corps or marching band we can see that everything is open, you know. But in concert band or orchestra you would have it closed. So you can see that there's multiple bounces on each hand. Now, in this page 26, we have exercises. This doesn't have to be followed rhythmically. All I wanna do is isolate each hand, and that's how I was taught when doing the multiple bounce roll or the concert roll, is to isolate each hand and get good at each hand's buzzes or presses. And that's really kind of what happens is I'm pressing into the pad. By the way, did you notice that I have a different pad? It is the, it's made by, it's a design by Remo Belly. It's from Mapex, the brand. And the reason why I have this with the real drum head on that is so you can hear the nuances in my press roll or in my buzz roll. So with that given said, let's go ahead and, and just try the right hand. The motion starts from the hinge in the elbow, believe it or not, which is different than, let's say, from a double stroke roll or other rudiments to where we come up in an up position or have a silent upstroke before we play, and that's triggered by the wrist. This is actually gonna be triggered by the elbow, okay? And so when I lift up, I'm gonna pinch in between my index finger and thumb, but I'm gonna retain a little bit looser of a grip and you can see how I pressed right down in the drum. It's not very stiff. It's just enough to give those multiple bounces. I'm given a little bit of a pinch in the index finger and thumb, not too much on the initial attack, but then I relax my fingers as I'm releasing the stroke onto the drum. So try that, start in the hinge of the elbow Now let's try our left hand. It's gonna be a little different, so. So you see that. Now I'm trying to get those individual strokes down. So in the first exercise here, in the multiple bounce roll, you just have the right. And again, it doesn't have to be half note value. You don't have to do this with a metronome can if you want but the more focus I would rather you have is on the actual stroke itself and then on the third line we're actually putting it together for right now you could just allow the stick to stop bouncing before you start the next one Right, so that's line three. And then line four is a little bit quicker. Again, I'm not really necessarily thinking quarter notes, I mean you can. Before the hand stops playing, the next hand is gonna start. So if you notice that when I give my buzz, I have a little weird sound at the very end. Listen to it again. That okay? Okay, so that's where I'm gonna start the next stroke. So if I go, that's where I'd start the next stroke, okay? And the idea, and I'll just run it open, closed, open, is to gradually get faster and maintain a constant sustained sound. And that's, I mean, with we were talking about earlier that you play one quarter note, one half note, one whole note, they all sound the same. Well, now here's our chance to actually make the snare drum or the drum or the pad sustain in a single sound. So here we go. I'm gonna do this open, closed open.
Okay, you get the idea. So obviously that's the end game or that's the goal that you want to achieve is to that, that nice sustain, kind of like a buzzing bee is what I would describe it amongst my students. And you don't want to pulsate the buzz roll or the concert roll like this. You level that out. Now there's different approaches with the concert roll. I know that uh, Buddy Rich had a, uh, what's called the whipped cream roll, where he actually, well of course he plays traditional, but, uh, but he had more of a, to where he's like whipping up something here in, in a bowl or, or what have you. So there's that, it just gives a different sound. And, and there is different concert rolls, you know, like drum set, you know, playing a buzz roll in a drum set might be executed differently than in the orchestra. Given that said, with the last three lines, you can see that we're, again, increasing speed. So rhythmically, you don't really have to pay attention to this. It's just trying to get A, each stroke, good enough. You know, just start out with the one. And start the other one. And and it's not going to be great the first time around. You might, you know, obviously if you're, this is too loose, right? So we want to make sure there is a little pressure or press. And that's why sometimes it's called the press roll because somewhat pressing into the drum. And uh, but once you get those elements down, then try to put it together. And remember. So yeah, I'm using a little wrist, um, but really it's kind of starting from here. And my fingers control how that response is happening in the drum between the drumstick and the drum head. So you're only gonna understand it as if you actually try it on your own and you do it and you think about the sound that you're trying to emulate, which is that of a buzz. And then there's that little weird sound at the end before, and that's the cue for you to start the next hand, okay? So isolate each stroke first, then try to put it together. What are we gonna use this for? We're not gonna actually play the concert roll until the very end. The last solo, solo number 10, has a concert roll in it. And I thought we'd start now to understand A, the concept of the bounce a little bit differently. Rather than letting that stick return like a free stroke, uh, you're actually pressing in and creating multiple bounces or multiple hits on that one stroke. And so that's why it's called the multiple bounce roll, you know, et cetera. With that said, you know, I do have a friend in the St. Louis Symphony and his name is William James and he is the St. Louis Symphony's principal percussionist as well as he also guest lectures over at the University of Missouri. And let's see if we can give him a call. And if he's not too busy, maybe we can pick his brain. He wrote a book called the, there, if we get it out, The Modern Concert Snare Drum Roll. And it's really, really in depth on the actual approach and how to approach a concert roll, the movements involved. I, I didn't really get a chance to get a deep dive into this, but I did have a good chance to look over it and the concepts that Mr. James is, is presenting here in this book. And let's see if he's available. And uh, I'm actually gonna have to put in my little trusty ear pods here. And uh, let's give him a call. Here we go. Thank you so much, Will, for joining Learning to Drum, the program here. I appreciate your time to be on the show. Uh, welcome, and we've given you a big introduction. No problem, glad to be here. Most of my students uh, are beginning students, and they don't really know anything about the drums, and uh, or they're you know self-taught, and they want to get into reading music and rudiments and things like that. We're up into the part of the season to where we're learning the concert role. The one thing that you made a point about in the role here, the concert role, is that it starts from the elbow. 
the motion, the stroke. Yeah, so the, the reason I wrote the book is I found that we historically have sort of taught the role sort of in a backwards way. And, you know, everyone learns to play drums from day one um, with single strokes where you're hitting the drum one time and it all hinges on the wrist. And the wrist is a great muscle and hinge to play both slow and fast strokes. And, you know, so much attention has been focused on the wrist from day one with any beginner student. And that's because it comes from a single stroke mindset. Now, when you're playing any sort of role, whether it's a double stroke role or a triple stroke or a buzz role, um, you're trying to do something different. And that means you're trying to create more than one stroke with one downward motion. And the wrist is just a very weak muscle in that regard in creating multiple strokes with one downward motion. And while it's certainly possible to play a role using the wrist as sort of the, the general um, you know, starter for that, the arm is just a much more stronger and powerful muscle to create that that multiple bounce. And so I um, and many other people um, advocate for using the arm to sort of create the downward motion rather than the wrist. And um, so that sort of goes against sort of what you learn on day one about single strokes. And so the book really walks you through how to learn a role using the arm and sort of um, locking or stabilizing the wrist when you're going up and down with the arm and it can be a little confusing at first but once you start practicing and get the hang of it it's like oh my gosh thank goodness I started this way rather than trying to you start with the wrist and sort of work backwards well yeah I know there's some really interesting concepts and um, that's one thing that I was taught is is you isolate the, the one stroke and you get each hand down uh, that's one thing I've noticed about your book. It takes you and walks you through that whole process, which is really nice. And uh, the one thing that I've noticed is, is the fingers. And when I'm initially giving the attack, at, at some point, the fingers become a little loose. So I'm a little firm in my fingers at the beginning of the attack. I'm using my elbow hinge, coming down, and... After a little bit of that initial attack, I'm relaxing my index finger and my thumb. Do, does that happen with you, or can you talk a little bit more about how the fingers play in the concert here? Yeah, the, the fingers really control how many bounces. If you are really stiff with the fingers, you're going to have a really tight, buzzy roll, whereas if you're a little bit looser, you might go into more of a double stroke or triple stroke roll. Um, so the fingers really control how many bounces you get out of the one stroke. And you you bring up a great point, um, you know, understanding what the role is supposed to sound like is actually one of the easiest parts of a snare drum roll. Like you're trying to create the illusion of some sort of sustained sound. So understanding what it's supposed to sound like is actually incredibly easy. Getting to that point is actually incredibly difficult. So I actually advocate for beginners to completely ignore sound, which seems odd um, when you're talking about music, and really focus on the technique and the way to make that happen. And once we have a great technique, it's actually really easy to work on the sound aspect, because it's, it's such a natural concept to understand. But initially, you know, it, and then I know it seems odd, like we really want to sort of ignore the sound coming out of the drum and focus on the technique, because once the technique is solid, the sound aspect comes really quickly. Right, and, and it's interesting you make about the sound uh, point, because I know when I was, you know, 93 is when I had my first real percussion teacher, uh, somebody who, Michael Ferris, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, yeah, you know, Strike Institute. Um, he's done wonders for this community here in St. Louis, and uh, and and he's taught me about the the concert role. And but when I was learning it back then in '93, 1993, uh, it was try. It, we were, our goal was to try to make a smooth as silk, uh, like buzzing bee that's not, not pulsating, 
But I've noticed uh, evolution-wise over the years, the last 20, 30 years, that, uh, that the, the concert world has just opened up slightly. I think it's personal preference. Okay. Um, you know, I think, you know, and I talk about it in the book, you know, you, you can use both for musical reasons. You know, a really open, smooth roll can be sort of more relaxed. But if you want something that's really tense, um, tense in a musical way, not tense physically. Um, you know, a really buzzy, energetic, aggressive role can really, you know, and sometimes in Shostakovich, you need a really, you know, sort of grab you role. So I'll, I'll probably use a faster, buzzier roll speed like you're talking about. So I, I let the music sort of dictate that. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's good to know too because. I do like, uh, Buddy Rich used to call it the old whipped cream roll, it's this, you know, smooth, and he, he actually did a, 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 a movement, a circular movement in that, and it just created a different sound, so it's really good that, and this is something that I've stressed to the people on the show, and uh, as well as my students, is it's really what goes into the ears and the counts, and, and, you know, what sounds the best and what's the easiest way to play it, you know, so... Um, well, really good points on the concert role. I appreciate that. And uh, just moving on, when did you start learning how to play the drums and percussion? What got you into it? Did you buy a drum or a practice pad when you first started out? Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Oh, yeah. I, I started playing percussion in middle school. Um, when I joined the middle school band, you actually you had to play a wind instrument for, for the first semester before you could switch to percussion because they, they really wanted to make sure you could read music and had a solid musical background. So I played trombone for like four months. <laughs> um, but, but then I switched to percussion and got the standard, you know, bell kit and um, practice pad and snare. And I think shortly after, pretty soon, got a snare drum and then, you know, sort of did the band and drum set route through middle school. And then in high school started learning, you know, um, a little bit more in earnest mallets and, and timpani and the other percussion instruments and, you know, really, you know, started doing summer camps. And that's, you know, like you said, like Strike Institute. I grew up in North Carolina, so we had different options. But, you know, every summer did something different and progressed pretty quickly. And, um, you know, fast forward two decades and, you know, three decades almost now. Now I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, one thing I noticed, I saw a video clip of you. I believe it was the U.S. Army. Uh, you folks were doing a rudimental solo, uh, so you have yeah. experience in the old school. How does that translate? Totally. How does that translate into the orchestral world? Do you find some of those elements bleeding over into the orchestral playing? Uh, well, technically, I, I play matched grip. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't I haven't played rudimental grip um, regularly in, in a long time. It's it's still fun to go back and, and play. Um, and actually with my students, if we have, I always try to find some time when I have time with students, if, if we have a month or six or eight weeks where there's nothing really pressing, it's like, all right, well, like this is the time we're going to learn, learn how to play rudimental snare drum with a, tradi with a traditional grip. Um, even though I really advocate for match grip mostly, but it's really good to spend a little bit of time learning traditional grip because it's really useful even just on bass drum like having a being able to play a good bass drum role with the traditional grip um but it's really fun to play all that i mean i i mean i've played every wilcox and eight two there is and it's a great intro to snare drum and the multiple bounce concepts i mean like like i talk about in the role and controlling the stick. I mean, it's a natural musical transition from stick control into actual music and controlling the stick. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So and that's one thing I've noticed is is being in drum set, being in uh, drum corps, being in an orchestra. Uh, you know, it, it's definitely different approaches. But uh, there's some things that you can transfer over. On our show, we uh, we learn match grip, and uh, you know. But I've explained to the people that I like to play my rudiments traditionally but then you then you start to run into trying to keep both up on the same level and i'm starting to run into i need to go back to my match grip and work on that a little bit more so um so speaking of uh you know bass drum snare drum cymbals tambourine these are all the instruments that you play you have a program out called the repertoire 
which is a, an absolutely outstanding program because I wish I had this back in my uh, day of 1993 college. Oops. But uh, I think you remember at, at one point we used to build our orchestral excerpt binders. And, and in there we would have a section for bells or glockenspiel, uh, snare drum, timpani, and the like. In the orchestra, to audition for any orchestra, whether it be a community orchestra, a high school orchestra, you're going to have to audition. And in auditioning, they don't, you don't sit up there with a, a solo or they ask you to run scales or play certain rudiments. You actually play excerpts from real classical pieces in the orchestra. And that's what this repertoire is about. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how can we access that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of other instruments have created similar resources, and because percussion is so visual, and because, while it's certainly not easy, it's a lot easier now than it was, you know, a decade or two ago um, to do video, um, everything is with video. It's not just audio. So you, you can see what I'm doing, you can see what kind of mallets I'm using, what kind of instruments, what kind of techniques I'm using, um, and you're right, the, to play in pretty much any orchestra, um, the standard rep that we play is sort of the challenge that you need to learn uh, um, to get the, that opportunity. And I go through pretty much every standard one, there are a little over 80 included, and there's a video of, of just strictly me playing. There's no, there's no nothing. Um, so you can really dive into the actual playing and the music and then accompanying that there's a tutorial video that's much longer where I go into why I made the decisions I made, how I might play something differently in an audition versus how I might play it in the orchestra, sort of my thought process on how I practice, how I you know, choose a stick or a tambourine or a cymbal, you know, what musical decisions I make, and it's a great resource um, that's available through my website um, to individuals, if an individual wants to buy it, um, williamjamespercussion.com, and it's a, I think it's 11 to 12 hours of video footage in the whole package. Um, now, if you're a university or a group and you're trying to buy it for 10 students, you know, if you have a studio of 10, um, we we got a lot of demand for that as well. And you can buy that yearly through um, VAP Media, V-A-P Media.com. And that is um, sort of a college resource for university um, classes that you can take online. They have a percussion history club course. They have a xylophone history course and a, cu a couple other ones. And, and while mine's not necessarily a course, um, it sort of um, can be accessed the same way. Um, and it's a great, if you want to learn all of the standard repertoire, it's a great um, resource for that. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I've taken a look at some of those excerpts that you've put out there, you know, some sample uh, recordings of what that might look like and stuff. And this is something that's really important when you're talking about the tutorial section of that excerpt because the one thing that you can't teach through a book or hearsay is, is the way you approach the excerpt. Just one second. Yes, yes okay. we are. I'll, I'll be over there in a second, okay? <laughs> We're, I've got my daughter at home. So. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, I'm glad that you actually are involved with your kids. It's hard sometimes as a musician because our lives are so unpredictable and, and what have you. But uh, the Especially one thing... right now. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. Uh, but sure. uh, the one point I wanted to make is that, um, you know, you... Uh, it's important to learn how to approach that orchestral excerpt. There's certain uh, dynamics or accents that may not be written in the excerpt itself. And, and so like uh, Colabrignon, uh, and, and going through the end of that, I, I saw that, and I thought it was really interesting how those little points will actually make or break you in an audition for an orchestra. Yeah, I mean... Some, unfortunately, sometimes it's given this mystique that is intimidating, and, and I don't think that's the case. I think um, you're right. You want you want you want to play the piece, not the music notes on the page. Um, I remember when I got Colas for the first time. You know, I looked at it and I was like, "Well, this doesn't look that difficult." And you learn the notes and you play it, but it's not about looking at it like an etude. Um, you have to look at it in the context of the piece. 
And, you know, I talk a lot about, well, you know, is this an energetic piece or is this a laid back piece? Or do you want a really dark sort of deep sound or do you want a bright cutting sound? And that that may seem, you know, very simplistic. But, you know, if a piece is really dark and heavy and you're sort of playing with a light energetic touch, you know, that that's totally out of place. And while you may play the notes perfectly and your sound actually be great, it's just not in the right context. And that's really what's important with um, the excerpts. So if I purchase this program, it's a one-time shot. I have lifelong membership to it. And if you add to that, like, for instance, bass drum excerpts, you know, I played Rite of Spring a few years ago. And you're, they're going to have access to that as well, right? Yeah, individuals, it's a one-time purchase. It's $300. I understand that's a lot of money, but it's a it's a lot of, of excerpts and a lot of resource, and it's yours forever. Um, for groups, it's, it's done yearly because obviously studios turn over and students leave and students come back in. But that, that price point's a little bit different, and it's based on the number of students. But yeah, it's, it's a one-stop one shop, and um, it's, it's everything right there for you. Perfect. Okay, we'll have some links down at the bottom for everybody to go grab. Uh, WilliamJamesPercussion.com and then, of course, the uh, VAP uh, link will be down there provided. And uh, just a few more questions, and I know you have to go, but do you still practice on the basics, like your paradiddles, your flams, your flam taps? And uh, For me, I've never left it. I always have to kind of keep in shape with it because it's like an athletic, but uh, I just wanted to ask you that question. Yeah, I mean, when I... Am learning a big piece or got a big project or something. I, I maybe don't spend as much time on it, but certainly every day I'm warming up with those things. Whether that's only for 10 or 15 minutes, but you know, if I don't have something really big, then I'm actually spending more time on that sort of stuff. You know, I might spend 45 minutes to an hour just on basic skills and rudiments and stick control, and even Wilcox and etudes, things like that. Um, you know, I'll spend a lot more time if I don't have something big coming up working on that. But I would say minimum 10 to 15 minutes before I do anything, I'm, I'm doing that sort of basic, getting the hands moving, waking my brain up, waking the hands up. Yeah, great. And do you ever walk away from a performance saying that I've done that perfectly? It's pretty rare. Yeah. It's pretty rare. Um, yeah, I wish it happened more. I mean, that doesn't mean that I'm not happy with the way um, I've played a lot of concerts, but, but um, you know, we we try to keep our standard pretty high, and um, it's it's pretty rare that that I I walk away that feeling like, well, gosh, I wouldn't have changed anything. Yeah, right. I mean, for me, and you know, we explain this that there's mistakes that happen all the time, and uh, you know, it, to do it without passion is is an insult to the music, you know. So. Um, any advice that you'd like to give to, let's say, beginning students, but also ones that are kind of returning uh, to the uh, education, like they want to learn read music and rudiments, and, and any parting words that you'd like, because I know you got to get back to your kids. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, music is is supposed to be enjoyed, and while there's certainly times that it has to be taken very seriously, and we have to dive into the nuts and bolts and maybe that aspect isn't the most fun ever um ultimately like we're not we're not doing it like you know we're digging ditches and we're playing music and so you, you know you've got to enjoy it and that's the reason we all do it and i'm very fortunate to be able to do it for a living um but whether you're playing just by yourself at home on a snare drum or a drum set or if you're playing in a band um you know, we all got into this because we enjoyed it. So make sure that ultimately you're doing it because you want to enjoy it and have fun. I mean, I, I understand that there's times where it's maybe not so fun if you're trying to overcome sort of her, some hurdle, but ultimately we're doing it because we enjoy it. Absolutely. Yeah. It, well said. And thank you so much, Will. Really appreciate your time to take away from your kids. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day. And I'll talk to you soon. All right, sounds good. Thank you. All right, take care. Okay. Well, what did you think about that? That's a lot of cool information that uh, Mr. James has given us. Will's a very nice guy, and I've frequented it, the symphony when they're playing Star Wars, and my oldest son, Kai, is a Star Wars fan, and uh, we always go down and say hello to him after the concert. 
He is a very nice guy and by all means look him up. The education group purchasing packages offered at VSA uh, and the link is down there at the bottom in the comments is a really, really good deal. If you can get 10 people to all chip in, you know, 25 bucks if you're at a college or university or unlimited students for a high school level. And so anybody who's considering joining the orchestra later on in life or in the near future, start working on these excerpts now. And obviously I understand that a lot of this stuff is probably over most of yours heads. I get it, but at least you're now exposed to that world of the orchestral player. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. We've had a special guest, Will James, on. Next week, we're going to continue on in page 27, and we'll start on study 10. And you can take a look at it if you want. Keep working on the multiple bounce roll or the concert roll. Keep working on your paradiddles. Keep working on your double paradiddles. Keep working on your double stroke roll your eight on the hand, uh, accent exercise both with alternating hands as well as on one hand. A lot of stuff to practice on and you know as, as Will said, you know there's a reason why you're doing this and it's to have fun and there was a reason why you started playing in the begin with. So I always remember is to keep having fun but also keep swinging those sticks. We'll see you next week. I'm your host Adam Tedlin on Learning to Drum. Take care.